Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Now let us go into, let us continue where we stopped this morning. Um, so let us say a word of prayer and then we'll start. Dear Father, we thank you for another opportunity to sit down, to study, to learn this very complicated subject. But at the same time, we ask you for the Holy Spirit to be present, help us to understand. And we ask you in Jesus' name, in the name of the Holy, Sp in the name of, uh, Holy Spirit, amen. All right, um, I see some new faces here. I cannot repeat what we said this morning. Uh, this morning, just to recapture a little bit, this morning I shared with you what the emerging church is, basically what has been happening in the last about 15 years, since around the turn of the century. I gave you approximately half a dozen of major characteristics of the emerging church. Things that I want you to remember, not to forget, and that is we are not talking about another denomination, another church. So that has to always, always have to keep that in mind. Actually, that word emerging, that word church means community. But emerging community doesn't sound attractive, okay? So they chose emerging church. Um, when they, now you will see in the second part that the word emerging also has a meaning. It does not exactly mean coming to the scene or coming out as something new. It actually means evolving. It is very much, when you use the term emerging, think of evolutionary theory. Okay, that it was evolving. In other words, the emerging church is evolving church, evolving community. Okay, so that is the meaning. You have to keep that in mind. So I pointed out to you that as this group of these pastors, teachers, and I mentioned Tony Jones, Brian McLaren, Doug Paget, uh, Tim Condor, and some others, as these, are, these people are considered like founders, in quotation marks, founders. And you, you, we cannot really put a date when it was founded. Uh, I mean, June 21, 2001, it is mentioned in the book. Tony Jones talks about it in his book. But that's taken, because that, that was a conversation in which they decided, okay, how are we going to call ourselves? And so they decided, okay, we'll call ourselves the emerging church. But the idea of the emerging church existed even before. And I traced it back. There is literature, there are books which exist. And the very first book, the earliest that I found, is book in paperback in two, uh, two parts. A, and the title is The Emerging Church, and it was published in 1968, which is only about three years after the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council. And it is um, much of that stuff that I shared with you, honestly, is not original, my original, that I'm coming up with it. I'm simply connecting the dots. Uh, much of the stuff that I share with you about what happens, what happened at the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, the connections between the um, contemporary emerging church movement and the Second Vatican Council, that's made by the scholars and by, matter of fact, by the Catholic scholars. Uh, the emerging church meant as the church comes out of the Second Vatican Council. Now, when you, you can use that as the Catholic Church is emerging out of the Second Vatican Council. And you can also say it is the church, capital C, that means all Christians, all Christian churches, emerging after. 
And therefore, so that is basically what I shared with you. Now the question is, one of the big questions is, what happened at the Second Vatican Council? And that is a question that is still being debated among scholars. Interesting thing is, I gave you, I told you something about, now I'm adding to what I told you earlier. The interesting thing is that the uh, Second Vatican Council closed in 1965. And for many Christians, even including Seventh-day Adventists, they have to do something about it. And they did it. And they did it in a very interesting way. Second concept is ressourcement, which is French word, which means going back to sources. That now, once you catch up, once you update yourself with society as a church, well, then you have to offer something to the church, to the people. So what do you do? All the doctrines don't work anymore. At least the way you package the doctrines, the way you articulate the doctrines. People don't want to listen to it, this generation. So what they do is now they come up with this, well, we are going back to the sources. So it's, it's like we are going to go back and then restudy it or, or maybe reinterpret it. We take a different, but we go back to the sources. The problem is when they speak to the sources, the question is now what sources? And for them, for the emergence, the sources to which they go is the early fathers. We're talking about starting in about second, third century up to about seven, eight, or nine. So there is a very much a rehabilitation in contemporary literature. There is more and more emphasis on early fathers. And then fathers throughout all these centuries. And so don't be surprised if you go back and now look at the literature written, for example, um, okay, I'll, I use the Richard Foster because a lot of, some of you know who Richard Foster is. How many of you have heard of him? Okay, you, you know of Richard Foster. Okay, many Adventists use the literature of Richard Foster. They didn't recognize what it is. But you, you go from his earliest writings and then go all his books. And what is happening, you can see more and more, the most recent publications by Richard Foster, the greatest heroes of literature, the people that we are supposed to admire, are the mystics for the last 17 centuries. So there are the, the, those are the sources we go back. That's what they're talking about, going back. Well, the problem with that is you and I, when I talk to the, let's go to the sources, I'm talking about the apostles in Jesus Christ, not the church fathers. Now, that's a, there, is a whole new, uh, there is a whole new, I don't have time to go into it. There is a whole new subject on patristic Christianity versus biblical Christianity which I teach in church history. See, when people talk about Christianity, they're basically talking about patristic Christianity. i share with you, when I go to professional meetings, and sometimes I am also, because I'm a historian of secular history, so I go to professional meetings which have nothing to do with Christianity. They're just... Uh, for example, Association for Advancement of Slavic Studies. And um, you know how it is during the lunch conversation, all that. Sooner or later, people find out. And sometimes they, oh, that I'm a Christian. The, for example, they see me if I pray, if I mention something and so on. And there were times when people say, oh, you're a Christian. And I don't respond, yes, I am. I learned very fast and I... Kind of, I like sometimes to tease people, but I like to make them thinking. But also, seriously, I cannot, I cannot respond to them and, and tell them, yes, I'm a Christian. So I usually tell them, well, I am and I'm not. 
Well, that really puzzles them now. Now they say, what do, what do you mean you are and you are not? I say, well, if I tell you I am Christian, that would be the end of the conversation because you would put me in a box what you understand the Christian is. And most likely what they know is Catholicism, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals. That's what Christianity is for them. And I say, I am none of that. But I am a Christian, and therefore let me tell you what I believe, and then you put me in a box. And then I start telling them, and they say, well, I never heard of that. Well, they say, now you have a new box. Okay? <laughs> So what I'm trying to tell you with that is that when people speak of Christianity, they don't necessarily mean exactly what you talk about. Because they talk about patristic Christianity. Christ, histor, I use another term, historical Christianity. Christianity which developed through history. But it's not necessarily biblical. You can call it Torah, but you have Pentecostal, you have Coptic, you have Orthodox, you have all kinds of Christianities. But Catholic is only one. Okay? You have many other kinds of, because through centuries, uh, all these divisions, and they would evolve in different directions. But all of them, even Protestants, though they broke away from the Catholic Christianity, even the Protestants, whether they are Lutherans or Presbyterians, you can say even Methodists, none of them continued the process of reforming. Because the Reformation meant going back to the, the Bible, but none of them continued to go to the Bible. May I use a term that I haven't used yet? Christianity over the centuries, starting as early as the, I have evidence as early as the second century, but most likely because Paul speaks about problems in the churches, it started probably right there in the middle of the first century. We're talking about apostasies. The church was, and started in the second century, church fathers as early as the second century, as early as the middle of the second century, began to deliberately distance themselves from Judaism, Old Testament, and the Torah. Deliberately. That was done deliberately. In that process of distancing themselves, they were departing farther and farther, farther away from the Old Testament. And so when they began to discuss issues, and one of the big issues for them was the topic of the atonement. When I was in Minnesota at a meeting, at a meeting of the emergence, they had a conference there, I went to see it, so well, let me see what they're doing. And I met there an Episcopalian pastor, retired Episcopalian pastor, uh, I'm sorry, retired Episcopalian bishop. And I met there an active, not retired, Lutheran priest. And I asked them, and I, because, uh, because they told me earlier that they are involved with the emerging church from 2002, very early there. So I asked them, I said, okay, Tell me, what are some of the issues that you guys struggle with the most? Because they already found out why I'm there, and I told them that I, I'm, in, I'm studying emerging church movement, and I, I want to know that's why I'm here. I want to know what you guys are doing. I want to see, get a little of your spirit here, sense it, you know. Get, uh, so because I don't want to misrepresent you and all of that, so anyway, I asked them, what are the issues? And they, uh, the, the bishop tells me, well, I can tell you this. He says, there are three of them. One of them is 
we really don't know how to handle the Bible. That did not surprise me much. Okay? Then he said, what gives us more difficult problem is how do I don't know we don't we don't know how to handle homosexuality. That did not surprise me either. But then the next one did surprise me. And he said, and the third one is we really don't know what to say and do with the atonement. To which I responded to him, I said, Well, give me the pulpit for about three hours and I'll tell you. <laughs> to which the Lutheran responded because, and I learned eventually that he knows much more about Adventists than the Episcopalian bishop hardly knew anything about Adventists, to which Lutheran said, well, I know what you're going to tell us. We are not interested in it, which immediately gave me, oh, oh, okay, now I understand. I can see the vibes, okay? He is not interested to listen. So, but nevertheless, we spent several hours together talking, three of us. So the uh, atonement issue is a big issue for the, aton for the emergence today. And, and I will share something with you here. I have a few slides. Do you know? Okay, can you guess what is the, what is the top? What is, okay, let me put it a different way. You are aware, at least some of you are aware, of all the atonement theories that float out there among Christians on the theory of atonements. Some of you don't, some of you do. Okay? There is approximately a dozen plus theories of the atonement. Uh, you probably heard of the ransom theory, satisfaction theory, penal substitution theory. Oh my goodness. What guys do you, what did you read? What <laughs> Moral influence theory. Oh, you heard that one? Okay, and you are opposed to it. <laughs> okay, there is about a, a dozen of in, uh, dozen, but about five, six, the most important ones. And um, since I'm there, let me just oh, that's not the one. Okay, I have here only about five of them. These are kind of, they stand out of the others. The ransom theory, satisfaction theory, penal substitution, moral influence, and Christus Victor. Now, the one that they have the biggest problems with is the penal substitution. And you know why is that? Because the present generation of people, this this generation, the postmodern, post 1960s, 70s, and you just go out there and talk with them. You'll, you'll see that. You know. They have extremely difficult time to accept the fact, or maybe to accept the idea that God can and will destroy. They cannot put together and accept that God will kill. And for them, the idea that Jesus, innocent one, was killed on the cross by God, for me, just doesn't make sense. They don't want to accept it. They don't like it. And so therefore, they kind of reject that theory. Guess, guess which theory they like the most? Pardon me? Moral influence, of course. They like that one. But even that one is not exactly what fits with what they are talking about. So, um, I'll come back to it in a minute now. Let me see. Um, okay, and so, go back to this and just one more. Development of doctrine, that is not a principle. It's very important to keep in mind. What does that mean? 
Uh, this is uh, term development may not be strong enough for you, but um, this term was borrowed from the writings of John Henry Newman. John Henry Newman is a 19th century Anglican bishop who converted to Catholicism, became a cardinal, and eventually wrote a book on the development of theology. And basically what he was arguing, development for him means evolutionary. Think in terms of theology was evolving over centuries. Okay? So, I have to keep moving when I'm talking too much here. This is what happens when I'm left kind of free without following the... Um, Now, I gave you those three, catching up with society or updating. The next one is going back to the sources and then development of theology. Those kind of three concepts that were permeating the thinking of all these people. Now, theistic evolutionism, something has to be said about it. You may wonder, I just want to share a few slides, I'll do fast here, read as fast as you... Uh, re read uh, the slides as fast as you can. Um, I'm going to skip some of these that are not important. Well, I told you already. Those that I skipped, I already shared that uh, with you. Pierre, Tha Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. This is the book. This is the phenomenon of man. That's his book. He wrote a number of books. Now, while he was writing his theological books, he has problems with the Vatican Curia. When he was writing about science and paleontology, all of that stuff, they did not have problems with it. So many of his articles were published. However, as he was writing this manuscript, and he was doing this while he was in China, he completed this book manuscript by 1946, and he asked, then he submitted his manuscript to the Vatican Curia, asked for the imprimatur, for uh, to be uh, permission to publish, and they forbid it. They, matter of fact, forbade him even to teach at the universities. The reason for that is they simply they didn't see, they simply did not know what to do with him, because many of these conservative Catholic. Uh, uh, Cardinals, whoever are there, they were still creationists. They still believed that God created the world. And here this guy comes and he is now giving a completely different. Because he, as I told you earlier, he accepted the evolutionary theory, accepted, he disagreed with Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin argues that evolutionary theory is driven by the process of natural selection. Tayyard de Chardin argues that evolutionary theory is driven by, evolutionary process is driven by the principle of emergence, which actually means that God, God is, becomes part of that process and eventually, not only that he intervenes, but he becomes part of that process. So, uh, how, okay, um, look at this. During the 1920s, he was well known in Paris, Parisian intellectual circles. After 1945, I know that some of you, some of you, Jean-Paul Sartre doesn't mean much. But those of you who are, at least have some education, you know Jean-Paul Sartre. It's a father of existentialism, very important philosopher, highly respected, well known. After 1945, Tayard and Jean-Paul Sartre are were the two most sought after speakers tells you about the popularity. When Harper and Collins conducted a recent survey, recent means about six, seven years ago, the, and they tried to find a survey of 100 most important spiritual books in the 20th century, guess which book was number one? The Phenomenon of Men. That means how many people read it. I'll tell you at one of the meetings where there are a lot of other Christian uh, Adventists who are struggling with theistic evolutionism. A lot of faculty. 
How do you put together? <coughs> Science gives you evidence. And then here you are a Christian. How do you put it together? I heard an Adventist scientist say, I was at a meeting, I, I don't like to point, I don't want to say a name, doesn't matter, I don't want to even tell you where the meeting is, so you don't start, because you're going to start trying to figure out who it is. Um, and young man was struggling, and he said, I all, I, I'm struggling, he's a scientist, he's just, how do I put it together? And then, he, as he was talking to the audience, and then he said, Finally, he said, I came across a book which put it all together nicely for me. And then he pulls out Phenomenon of Man and he starts reading. So, serious stuff. Uh, Kofi Annan, UN, Secretary, General Secretary of the United Nations, in 2005 made that this statement. Finally, I'm convinced that Pierre Teilhard de Chardin is a thinker for the 21st century. Very influential person. Now, uh, principle of emergence driving force. Let me just show you. This is his chart. This is how Teilhard. This is out of his book. Now, notice that Entire, according to him, entire creation, which started approximately 15 billion years ago, 14 billion for some scholars, it started and then it begins to di uh, diverge. That's why you have differences in creation. And as we go, we come approximately here to a point. Notice how now everything is beginning to converge. And for Tayar de Sharan, this is how he understood it. Everything started here, and at certain points, the divine will intervene in the process and then continue. It's a part of that process until we have this stage here, which is called Christogenesis. And that is a part when Christ, incarnated himself, became part of this evolutionary process. Now, when he talks about incarnation, he's not talking exactly what happened 2,000 years ago. Because uh, language is here kind of vague, talk 10, 15,000, something like that. Now, I am... Okay, I'm going to simply have to skip this. I'm sorry, you just don't have time. I'm going to give you this. This is Tayard's. I'm just I'm taking this, the graph that you saw it, and I'm trans putting it in different positions so that you can see it a little better. This is what he says. Okay, you see, this is this is representation of everything is diverting. It is going, to di and then there is a point of conversion. And uh, the po uh, what is important here is to remember now, I'm reading this here, this line. Uh, creation is on its way to fulfillment, and it's driven by the principle of emergence. Okay? Now, this here, uh, you will see, the, I'm reading this point here. I'm going to just tell you, uh, you uh, I, don't know, I hope you can see it from here. Which of these, each of these four evolutionary processes, do you see this? There is a cosmogenesis, biogenesis, new genesis, and Christogenesis. Now, these processes, I'm trying, what he says, and I try to present this with colors, this is kind of gray, and so you see it continues, biogenesis green and continues, this one continues, and this one continues. What he is saying is, that these processes do not start and stop. They start and continue. And so what is happening approximately 15 billion, billion years ago, that's when cosmogenesis, cosmos is born. It just begins. This is pure matter. Approximately 2 billion years ago, we have the second, that is biogenesis. That, mean, that means life emerged in this process. Of course, how? You'll say, well, it is divine 
intervention. God in, uh, uses the term divine force. I mean, it, it intervenes. And so you have life emerges. Then approximately one million year, uh, years ago, we have emergence of intelligence. And that process keeps going on. And men, human being, the men, that's what he calls it, the phenomenon of men. For him, the human being is the highest emer point of emergence. And now, Christ, Christogenesis begins. Now, the task of the Christ is to take the entire creation toward the omega point. At which point the entire creation becomes one with Omega. Wow. Now you can see what's happening here. Some theologians are beginning to dare to say that after all, God's love is so huge and big beyond your comp comprehension and mind, that in the end, God will save everybody. So you can see that now. Well, it's... So that is the background, okay? Tayyar de Shadan, okay, he did his work. He left, this is all left behind. It is the others who pick up on it and they're building uh, the case. Now... Um, let me share, my goodness, this time is passing by so fast. Time flies when you have fun. Okay, since I'm talking about worldview, I have to point out something to you. And I'll do this now in five, six minutes. I hope I'm going to butcher it, but uh, when the book comes out, you can read it more carefully. But you need to understand worldview is extremely important. And we, I don't think we know it very much. See, this is his diagram. This is what I just told you about, the stages. This is, again, just kind of an upside down. I turn it around because it's easier this way to understand. The question is, what is a worldview? Now, if I were to ask you, is, do you, do you believe that there is a, such a thing as a medieval worldview versus modern worldview? Do you believe? Is there anyone here who will challenge me and say, no, no, that's one and the same thing? No. They are there. Everybody knows that. That's so simple. There is such a thing as a medieval worldview and there is such a thing as a modern worldview. Now, we all know that medieval times come before modern times. And we all know that there is a transition. Don't we? Well, the question is, how did people... Now I'm talking about society at large. And basically, to those intellectuals and people who are in power, people who matter and all of that, uh, little peasants in the countryside, probably they had to struggle to survive. They didn't have time to think about this. If they know, if the peasant wants to know what's the truth, the peasant goes to the priest and asks, hey, what's the truth? The priest tells him and he believes it. So, the point is, now, how we have this switch? There is a transitional period. Do you know that? From medieval worldview to modern worldview. And that transitional period took a number of years. And the, the mechanism, the tools, the vehicle, which helped it the most, is what? Can you guess? Some of you historians who know history? It's literacy, of course, but it is the printing press. The books. What I'm saying, based on my study, emergence Christianity is a transitional period towards something after modern worldview. Post-modernity, we are going to a transitional. Matter of fact, this is in, the, okay, this is in the making. 
Something is happening here serious. Why do we have a large number of our young, our young people being attracted to emergent worships? Remember what I talked to you? This, we have to do something about our worships, about uh, understanding of the gospel, of learning Bible. I see, I see a president here at my conference, and I'm sorry to report to you guys. Do you know that half of my students hardly know anything about the Bible? I'm sorry, that's, that's, I, you know, if I ask my students how many of them read at least a little bit of the Bible on a daily basis, more than half don't do it. They don't find it relevant. You, you cannot imagine, you know, the impact of contemporary culture, audio, Okay, we talked about television and satellites. We are now talking internet. Now we are talking Facebook. We are talking about Twitter. We are talking about cell phones. We are talking about these young people are so impacted. Today, what operates is people want to be satisfied right now, fast, and people who are influential authoritative, that means who are the most influential in their lives, are celebrities. You guys, I mean, I deal with students all the time. And um, I, I, it's too much negative, okay, anyway. Let's have to move forward. If I were to ask you, what do you think is the question that bothers that bothers human beings the most. You know, yeah, you are close to it. People say meaning of life, all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, the question that bothers people the most, it doesn't matter when you live, 5,000 years ago or today, it is the question of death. Everybody. Sooner or later, maybe when you are young, those of you who are young, maybe you don't think about dying because you are young and, you know, the world is in front of you to conquer it and all of that. But sooner or later, by the age of 45, 50, when you begin to feel aches and when you begin to bury your dear ones, sooner or later you will come to a point where you will be facing death into, uh, and then you will say, that's, that's the question that struggles that all generations struggle with. Question of death, pain, suffering, evil, injustice, and then you can name it. So you can, the list can go on. But that's question of that. That is the question that everybody wants to come up with some answers to it. And you can start, you start reading the literature from Epic of Gilgamesh that goes about almost 2,000 years B.C., and you can read the literature of the Mesopotamians, of the Egyptians, of the Greeks, of medieval age. You read it today. You read pieces of literature one after the other. One theme that struggle, people struggle with is the question of death, suffering, and evil. And human beings are always looking to find answers to that. Then, and, and then... In order to answer that question, you have a whole series of other questions. For example, is there God? Are there gods? Is there, is there some superior force? Or what happens when people die? Who are we human beings? Where do we come from? Then how do we know what's right and wrong? I mean, who decides? Is it the biggest in the, the, the smartest? Is it majority? Who decides what is right and what is wrong? On what basis do we decide that? Question of how do we, how do we know what we know? What are the sources? What are the means that 
so that we, through which we learn. Where do we go when we want to learn the truth? Where? In ancient times, people would go where? They go to oracles, to temples, to priests. That's where they went. During the Middle Ages in Western civilization, of course, they would go to the church, to the priest. During the modern times, they would go to... They go to scientists. They don't go to the priests. It, this is so important to keep in mind. Notice, just observe ourselves. Even preachers, when they preach, will cite somebody. Why? Because there is this urge. If I don't cite an authority, oh, then you're talking, that's your own. And nobody wants to listen to your own subjective stuff. I haven't seen a preacher for years who would simply open the scriptures, read the scripture, make comments, and close the book. That's not a good sermon. I need to cite somebody. And the more authors I cite... Now, I am not against citing authors. Okay, Don't misread me here. I'm not against intellectuals. I am one. I make a living because of that. But what is happening is we have to be aware this idea that if I want to know the truth, I rather go to the scientist than to a pastor or a priest. Do you see how much it changed? We are influenced by it. So today, modernism is kind of losing popularity. So what do you think postmoderns, if they want to know the truth, where do they go? <laughs> well, they, okay, no, no, wait a minute. Be careful here. They will tell, no, they will tell, tell you, no, there is no one truth which is absolute and a great story which applies to everybody. But they know that there is truth. And there are many truths. Okay? So sometimes they are confusing truth with the body of knowledge. Body of knowledge is about knowing about stuff. Truth goes beyond what is known stuff. That's why, okay, keep in mind, this is what I'm trying to tell you. There are questions in life. Okay, if you ask a question, what, uh, what career should I have? Well, that's a personal question, and that, that really is not a fundamental question of life. You can be a mechanic, you can be a doctor, you can still make a living and live. Uh, how far is Earth from Sun? That's not a fundamental question. Scientists can measure that, and that's okay. Fundamental questions of life are questions which science cannot answer. Though scientists try to. For example, is there God? Scientists can tell you there is no God. But that's an assumption. Because scientists cannot prove there is no God. The fact that scientists don't consider God or they deny God, the fact that you have not seen God does not mean God is not there. It's pure assumption. When you say there is God, that's assumption. You cannot prove to anybody that there is God. You see, we're talking a level of beliefs. You can ask me, why do you believe in God? Well, there are a lot of evidence that makes me believe, and I accept to believe, and I believe there is God. And for me, that can become a fact. But scientifically, nobody can prove one or the other. What what happened to human beings? Where do human beings come from? These are all assumptions. Now, you can tell me, well, I know it's from the Bible. But you know it because you read the Bible, you accept the Bible as the authority. How do you know that Bible? Who, who wrote that? Well, you know, Moses wrote it. Well, how do you know he knows? Well, God told him. Well, we are back in the square. Well, how do you know there is God? You see, it's always you believe it. So when you come to these questions, 
who decides what's right and wrong, uh, what's the meaning of life. What? These are fundamental questions of life. And it's interesting. This is what worldview, worldview is based on. Now, let me give you some uh, definition. Simple as this, if you can remember this. Answers that you give to fundamental questions of life. And do you know that every one of you has worldview? You get it. You begin to acquire it since the day you are born. You are growing and you are learning answers to the questions that you have. And as you are growing, you are forming and you already know stuff. I know there is God. How do you know? Well, that's how my parents thought. You see, you acquire that. It is only when you become an adult and begin people to challenge your assumptions. And this is now where we can believe, begin to change. We are always talking about matters of faith. And what is happening to us today, my friends, is our people are beginning to change those assumptions. And what I am doing is basically... Um, okay, this is, this is the best definition I could come up with that I have seen with, well, this is. Um, Sire came up with this one. Worldview is a commitment, a fundamental orientation of the heart that can be expressed as a story or in a set of a presuppositions. Our story is what? Great controversy, okay? Um, set of presuppositions or assumptions, they can, see, they may be true, they may be partially true, they may be false. Which we hold either consciously, subconsciously, or consistently or inconsistently about the basic constitution of reality and that provides the foundation in which we live and move and have our being. You heard of those expressions, oh, each one of us has his own glasses through which he sees the world. That's another expression for the same thing. You see, if you believe there is God, now the question is what kind of God do you believe there is? Because there are all kinds of gods. Brahman is not Yahweh. And when people begin to tell me, now I'm going to touch a nerve here. When people begin to tell me that Allah and Yahweh are the same, they are not. No, we believe the same God like Muslim. No, we don't. Amen. Our God is Jesus Christ. Amen. We are Christians not because of the Father, but because of the Son. Of course we believe in the Father. We pray to the Father. But our God is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the incarnated Yahweh. And for Muslims, Jesus Christ and Allah are not the same thing. So don't tell me that they believe in the same God I believe. I'm sorry. I mean, while they do it, probably they are playing at that word God. They are trying to build bridges. I understand all of that. And I don't bother them. Let them do their work. Let them do the best they can. But I'm talking to you. I'm talking to my students. Listen, because I don't want my students to believe that Oh, Allah and God is the same thing, so I can go and believe Allah. No, no, no. You stay here. Yes, it is. But, but it's not... It's, but Jesus Christ is not Allah. And I don't want my student to believe Allah and abandon Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ saves us, not the Father. Though Father and Jesus work together. You have, it, this is struggle. My friends, what bothers me the most is emergence. There's another thing is, they are taking the focus away from Jesus Christ to either the Father or the Spirit. Every time I see that focus shifting away from Jesus. To me, that's a red flag. You'll never go wrong if you stick with Jesus. Never. You start talking about, I heard some people, I pray to the Spirit. Ooh, ooh, hold on. Nowhere in the Bible do you have 
are we instructed nowhere to pray to the Spirit? And I, and I believe God knew why. Because there is another Spirit. And you'll confuse it. Holy Spirit is not visible. You can just see results of his work. But Jesus Christ is visible. Do you follow me? These are nuances. Does that article that I have in review, read that article, Lover and Seducer. Always remember that. They both talk very similar language. And seducer will seduce you if you're not careful. So anyway, um, I have these questions here. I, um, I have a few minutes here. Uh, Okay, these are the fundamental questions of life that Sire comes up with. I already uh, articulated that verbally. S uh, philosophers come up with these three, metaphysic, uh, metaphysic, epistemology, axiology. Sire breaks it down into seven. I like, now, Brown is mind questions. I like to add more questions in order to make issues clear because there are more problems. Now, this one, this is a question that I think it's very important for us. How, okay, how do we know what we know? Um, what are the sources of knowledge? This is a big question, I think, for all of us. What is the, where is the repository of truth? What will, what will Catholic tell you if you ask him this question? In the church. Every good Catholic will tell you that the repository of truth is in the church. I cannot say that. The repository of truth is in the scriptures. Okay? Now, what are the sources of knowledge? That's a fundamental question. It's important for this, in this scientific world. Is science alone answers to the questions? Matter of fact, science cannot answer fundamental questions of life. They can try, but they, I'll show you what they give. Those are all assumptions. Okay, if you want to know the answers to fundamental questions of life, where do you go? You go to the scriptures. And what I have found out is that the scripture doesn't deal with just any kind of questions. Scripture doesn't tell you about how nature works. It tells you here and there probably something, but those are kind of insights. The scripture deals with fundamental questions of life. See, those are God's answers. Now, for me, that is... Uh, see, I take God's answers as my assumptions, and I take them as facts. So, as time is passing by, okay, this is what I've done. You see this blue circle? I ask my students, okay, write on one side the fundamental questions of life, and you can have those, I don't know, dozen of them. And then imagine we have um, Carl Sagan, Richard Dawkins, and some of these scientists who are denying existence of God, and ask them, Answer the fundamental questions of life. And I believe these are the answers they would give it to you. Okay, there is no reality beyond reality in which we exist. There is no God, no spirits. Matter is all there is. It is indestructible, eternal. Everything came into existence through evolutionary process. Natural selection and cause and effect induce events, processes, behavior. Human beings are complex machines. Death is extinction of life. Faculty of reasoning evolve. It's innate, autonomous. Uh, history is a linear stream of events. There is no purpose in life beyond what you decide to have. You make your purpose in life. These are answers. These are all assumptions. None of this can be proved scientifically one way or the other. People accept this, and this is how they operate. This is the glasses through which they look. Now, put that in the corner. Ask a Hindu to answer all those fundamental questions of life. These are answers that they were. Now, I, do you know what Om is? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Om is 
the essence and everything of the entire cosmos. In other words, that's Brahman. Now, Atman is a, each individual human being. The essence of each individual human being. However, they also say Atman and Brahman is one. So the whole point in Hinduism is for, you, for me to go through life and become one with the one. One capital. You see that? And so Maya, for example, what you see right here, Ma, that's when the question of reality. Maya is a kind the Buddha, Hindus will tell you, oh, everything you see, that's kind of an uh, illusion. It's, they call it Maya. What they are trying to say is that all of, everything that you see in life, suffering, pain, all of that, it's not really real. Just live with it. Go through it. The point is, as the life, wheel of life goes on, and you die, actually, your essence, Atman, never dies. Your body kind of dies, disappears, ruts. But then, if you are Dharma, Karma Dharma, if your Dharma is not good enough, then you come back. Your karma decides and you come back whether you're going lower or higher. The whole objective of the wheel of life is that you keep moving forward and the point is to get off of the wheel of life. That means you don't reincarnate back, but you become one with the one. But one is not a person. It's essence. It's some kind of a force. So when I asked a Hindu priest, I said, are you telling me that my ultimate objective is to become one with the one? And that means to cease to be individual, distinct person. He says, yeah. To which I respond, thank you very much. Do you see the difference? What is it that Moses' worldview now? If I ask you, bring Moses into the picture. Let Moses tell you the answers to fundamental questions of life. This is, I believe, now you can read it, um, God, Elohim, Yahweh Elohim, He's the creator, God alone is eternal, holy, omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, righteous, transcendent, imminent, apart from, na apart from nature. Remember, that's a very crucial, apart, one word. If you divide that A from part and you say it is A, part of nature, then you are talking about pagan gods. An interesting thing is all human religions. Pagan, Hindu, Taoist, Buddhists, Egyptians, Mesopotamians, Greeks, all pagan religions believe that gods are a part of nature. Yahweh is Yahweh's or Mosaic, Moses religion, or what we believe, the Old Testament scriptures. That's the only religion we speaks of God who is outside of cosmos. He created cosmos. That's, that's a distinction, the difference. Then you have, okay, human beings are free will, all of that. God is the lawgiver. He decides right and wrong. He's the source of knowledge, intellect, consciousness, or sets humans apart from creation. Human and created by glory for God. You see, these are the answers that you find. That's a biblical worldview. And I hope you and I live up to it. Now, I put it in three different colors. This is not red because uh, letters do not come through. Because, so I have to put it kind of orange. Uh, actually, imagine it's red. Now, you ask people how many worldviews are there. And people say, well, everybody has his own worldview there. Who says, well, if that's true, there are 7 billion of us, then there are 7 billion worldviews. And if you have 7 billion worldviews, then let's not talk about it because it's a waste of time. I, none of us can ever know all 7 billion worldviews so that we can make an intelligent decision which is the best one. There is no 7 billion worldviews. 
There are three major worldviews, which I'm identifying here. I still have some issues how to deal. Okay, Buddhism is a little, I, call, I would like to call this monist worldview, because Buddhism is a version of kind of breakaway from Hinduism, Taoism, Zen, all of that. So you have here basically naturalist worldview, okay? And then you say here you, there is super, uh, supernatural, divine, so this is monistic, but here you have also divine, supernatural, but these two are, uh, again, different, completely different, because we are talking about different kind of gods. Okay, so you see this? The lines here tell you closed system, that means everything is enclosed in gods and everything into system. Here you have open system, which means that God is outside of nature. Okay, here you have spiritual, both of these are spiritual, this is uh, atheistic. So you, you have, these are combinations. Now, people, human beings, people can be anywhere on this slide. People combine because they kind of mix and blend. I choose colors to point out to you another fact. When we deal with worldviews, we're dealing with ideas. It's like color. How many colors are there in the world? Depends who you ask. Of course, none of us believes there are three colors. We operate about a dozen of colors. Ask my wife, interior designer, she'll come up with a three, four dozen of them. Go to Sherwin Williams and he'll tell you, well, there are an in, uh, infinite number of colors. <laughs> that is what we are talking about here. Our objection should be to lead people to the worldview here. And to kind of tell them, listen, these are the best answers that you can have. After all, what is the answer that the best answer when it comes to the question of death? No religion will give you promise what Jesus Christ promises. He promises you you will remain distinct yourself forever. You're not going to die. These guys here will tell you, ah, oh, just live your life until you die and forget about it. This is it. It's over. These guys here will be, tell you all kinds of ideas. And you are one with the one. You are... Buddhists have slightly different versions. Catholics will tell you, well, see here you have a blend a little bit. Catholics will tell you, well, your soul lives on and uh, stuff like that, okay? No, no, no. You live as you are, distinct, in body, okay? Except different kind of body. All right, guys, now let me show you something. If you want to stay, it's already time over. I'm willing to stay a few minutes. I want to show you something about Teilhard de Chardin. This will blow your mind. I can take about a few minutes, just a few minutes. Now, look at this. Okay, let me see. I try to portray, to, to, to see the difference. We have creation of Adam and Eve, and this green here is representing world without sin. Okay? What happens is we have fall, that enters human race. Now I have a gray. We have flood. Then Torah, another imp important event. Exodus. Torah is a kind of incarnation. God's word is written down. Then we have apostasy, exile. Jesus comes. And then life continues for another 2,000 years until it comes to our days. And then what happens, I like to, okay, we believe that uh, Jesus will come soon. And then what happens is saints are taken to heaven. Then eventually New Jerusalem comes back. We have a period of time after Jerusalem comes to the ground. We have the resurrection of the wicked. There is a period of time. We really don't know how long. And then we have a point where destruction of Satan, wicked, and even death. It's gone. And then we have green again. Life without sin. Now, this is... We are talking here about another, add more information. This is important because of, we're talking about the kingdom of God. Here you have the kingdom of God lost. 
But God institutes already this promise that he is, okay, let me put it, make it bigger for you, okay? God institutes here the promise that he will bring the kingdom of God back. On the cross, he wins it. But now here it is when actually it is implemented. Is that what we believe? Okay. How do you know that second coming is coming uh, soon? The only prophecy which can tell you that we expect soon coming is the sanctuary doctrine in 1844. Okay? And then you have a destruction here, all of that. So you see that? Okay, now. The key term is here apostasy, destruction. Apostasy, exile. Apostasy, destruction. Now, I'm bringing you Tayar de Shodan. Do you see it earlier? If you have cosmogenesis, biogenesis, new genesis, Christogenesis. Now, this is not to scale. This is more to scale. But I cannot put it because I have to make a point here. So this is not to scale. All of this would come up probably somewhere here, okay? Because of this 15 billion years length. The point is here that from this point on, Christ takes entire creation to Omega. For emergence, and I, have, I don't have time to show you, I'm sorry, atonement theory, atonement in praxis, for emergence. This is the kingdom of God here and now. This scheme destroys not only Adventist scheme, but even Schofield and all the other Protestant schemes. That is the reason that evangelicals are big critics of the emergence. See, here I mentioned to you earlier the emergence. Emergence completely discard all of these schemes, whether it is our Adventist or some other, you know, seven years of rapture and all of that stuff. They, they think that's ridiculous. They also discard the idea of the eternal burning hell. You can see why. It just doesn't fit into this. Now, not all emergents are fully aware of this. Because the question is how far each individual has emerged. Brian McLaren will feel comfortable with this. This is what mystics kind of believe. This is what is now overtaking. And social activism and kingdom of God here and now, that is the key driving force right now. So, when the Second Vatican Council called people to holiness, what they did is, I'm wrapping it up here. They did, first of all, they made the mass mandatory that good Catholics should have a mass at least weekly if not daily. It becomes mandatory. The church tells them you can read the Bible, even Protestant versions. And many Protestants say, wow, that's a big thing. Well, it is a big thing, but at the same time the church is now talking about also spiritual disciplines. Well, you can read the Bible, but if you read it as a spiritual discipline and you move into spiritual formation, then you are not talking sanctification. You remember I told you it's a counterfeit? Spiritual formation is forming your spiritual life through spiritual disciplines. That's human effort. Sanctification what is what God does in you. You let him do it. He'll do it. And I hope you believe that God can change any kind of sinner. Any kind of sinner. Okay? So, there's a huge differences here. Now, they call people to sanctification, to holiness. But then, keep people busy. 
involve them in social activism. And they miss the point. So, I really, I'm 10 minutes over, I should not do that. Last semester, I taught the entire semester on this subject. So there's so much to say, there is so co complex, so much challenges, and may God help you.